going through that. This is a little review. Oh, good idea. Thanks. Here we go. All right, great. Um, ancient spiritual art as it relates to contemporary spiritual art. And we started off with the um, imagining an image of God, and we went back to the most ancient one we could find, which was the Venus of Willendorf. Um, it's the oldest deity that, that is known in art history, and related that to the modern stone sculptures that we have in our churches. Uh, the Lascaux cave paintings and relating it to modern worship. I don't know if you can, can see the animal worship there, but this was the beginning of um, a worship ritual uh, in ancient times and relating that to what we do as ritual in our modern um, worship services. And the prehistoric sites going from um, Stonehenge into our modern cathedrals. And this is actually one that was built, a cathedral that is actually still in prog progress in Barcelona. It's uh, the Cathedral of the Sagrada Familia, and it's by Gaudi, and it's really amazing. You should check it out. Um, anyway, we talked a little bit about uh, the Egyptian gods and borrowing of symbols, particularly the sun god. We borrowed the halo uh, imagery from them, but also the veneration of animal subjects that they use, that we consider very pagan, also is reflected in our symbolism that we use for this, which is a symbol of St. Matthew as an ox. You know, we have the eagle, the ox, the the, the, the lion and the man, symbolizing the apostles. And so th these actually go back to very prehistoric things. Uh, so it's not so far-fetched to think that we have some pagan roots in our Christian um, symbolism. We talked about this. This is a, a symbol of Apollo. And I still haven't been able to find a clearer slide of it. I apologize. Don't adjust your glasses. Um, but this is Apollo, the good shepherd. And we talked about how that related to our Christian symbolism of Jesus the Good Shepherd. And in those early times, that was real important to have symbols that were familiar in order to kind of obscure uh, what the Christian religion was because of its oppression. I'm going to take you back a little bit. This is uh, one of the oldest sculptures in Greece. This is called the Kouros of Thebes. And uh, it was a, a, a classical type of sculpture that they did. It was a male nude, and it uh, symbolized uh, perfection in humanity. Um, and it kind of looks like the old Egyptian sculptures. It's sort of stiff. It isn't very lifelike. Um, but it began the revolution of Greek statuary, this being um, more classical things. This is uh, Aphrodite and Hercules um, from the classical period. And I want you to note, oh, here it is. I do have a, um, the stampling of the serpent at the bottom. Again, we're looking for borrowed imagery. And we'll see this in some of our slides as we come up. Uh, the next one is also from classical Greek antiquity. This is Poseidon. And here you can see the real anatomical perfection of it. You can even see like the veins in his arms and everything. They were really perfecting, sculpting the human form at this time. Um, an interesting thing about this, it was found in 1926 under, uh, uh, underwater. And they just, uh, they just pulled it up. Some fishermen were fishing, and this is what they caught. Wouldn't that be a great catch, this Poseidon? Yeah. Um, was it? it was in a buried city called Heraclium. And I guess they found all kinds of things underneath there. But it's actually sunken under the water. And so they found a whole city um, where this was. So, and it's actually fallen under the water, which kind of makes me nervous about places like uh, Venice that are sinking, I think, four inches, a, four inches a year, is it? Yeah, it's really sinking. <laughs> so that'll be a, a buried city someday. Um, I wanted to relate some of those Stonehenge images with what they were doing in architecture at this time. This is the Temple of Hephaestus, and it functioned very similarly to the way our worship houses function now. It's a place for ritual and worship, and it was a place to offer sacrifices and things like that. I want you to sort of keep this in the back of your mind as we see it uh, progressing through the architecture that we're going to discuss. Oops, I'm not going to go through all this. Okay. Meanwhile, in Christianity, um, they were just using symbols because of the oppression and, the, um, and everything of the Christians. They weren't allowed to just come out and say, oh, you know, let's do the big pictures of Jesus because they would chop their heads off and the Greeks and the Romans didn't really like them. So they used a lot of symbolism uh, here, the lamb and the, the letters, the Cairo, symbolized Christ. They were the first two letters in his name in the Greek alphabet and also the dove symbolizing peace. 
Um, at the same time, this is more of the Roman um, and Greek classical uh, style. Uh, they were sort of combining cultures at this point. The Greeks and Romans were sharing a lot of, a lot of imagery. Um, after this period, there was the, what they call the late pagan, late antique period. Um, there was a gradual decline in techniques. And here we can see a very realistic representation of a human person. This is actually Aphrodite giving a, uh, an offering to Bacchus. So, Carrie, the previous one, where was that? On a building? Uh, it, it was in the catacombs. Yeah, a lot of the art that we found is in, is in different catacombs. Um, they didn't want to share the burial places, the pagan mm -hmm. burial places that they were allowed to have. And so they buried, the Jews and the Christians buried their people in catacombs because they didn't want to be in pagan Was burial places. So, the Yeah, they did a lot of carving. And last week we saw, after, um, after we're done, I can take you back to some of the slides from last week. We can see some more of the catacomb paintings. So, um, so this brings us to Byzantium. And this is a pretty broad area. It takes us from the, the period of the martyrs, the Christian martyrs, to where we, they could finally come out and say they were Christian and they could start building churches. I think the first Christian churches were built around 200 or 230 AD. It was the first time they could actually have a public place of worship and sort of be out of the closet with their faith. Um, this is a beautiful example of it. Uh, this is... Um, the Baptism of Christ in the Twelve Saints, and it's um, uh, in a place called the Baptistry of the Orthodox. And here you can see Jesus being baptized. The next slide is a little foggy, so just kind of keep this in mind. Uh, when, I, when I enlarge them to get the detail, a lot of times we lose resolution. Uh, but here you can see Jesus being baptized by John and the Holy Spirit coming underneath. And these are all the twelve apostles that are surrounded it. And it's a really beautiful design for that bapt baptism. Um, the Byzantine era started when um, Constantine uh, t relocated the center of Christianity from Rome to Byzantium, <laughs> and later called it uh, Constantinople. Later they changed it to Istanbul, but um, for this period of time, we're going to call it Constantinople. And um, during that time, there was uh, uh, something called icons and iconoclasm. Are you familiar with that? We talked about that last year a little bit. Um, they started to forbid the um, making of symbols of, or of images of Christ because there was um, controversy over whether people were worshiping the image or whether they were worshiping as part of their, their faith. And so they were the iconoclast, which is breaking the images. Icon is image and class is to break. So they were the image breakers. And a lot of these icons don't survive anymore, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Here we have in this, this is uh, Gala Placida. And this is 4th century in Ravenna. Um, again, we can see a little bit less um, realistic than the Greeks and Romans here. But we have this imagery. Christ is being uh, you know, seen in sort of a royal uh, garment. This is actually kind of a bridegroom garment with that, that stripe that goes around there. And here we see him as the good shepherd. Uh, here again in Gala Placida. Uh, remember the Aphrodite and Hercules. Um, Hercules stamping out the serpent or stamping out evil. Here we have Christ now taking on that symbolism of um, here he's in this royal Greek garment. Um, and in, at this time, they could finally come out and say, it says, ego sum via uh, verita, verita, veritas e vida, the way, the truth, and the life. And he, so they were starting some of their orthodox beliefs about what Jesus was and using some of the scriptures to teach. <coughs> Pardon me. Sorry, I'm moving. I'm a little bit out of order here because I was in New Buffalo last night. I have all that. So, yeah, it is. It's like, yeah, it's uh, actually they say that this is one of the um, the garments of like a Roman soil soldier or Roman royalty. Uh, the other thing that we notice is Jesus doesn't have a beard. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in the Roman time, that a bearded man was considered a barbarian, and so they never portrayed Jesus with a beard until later. Um, this is one of the first icons. Um, this is called the image of Edessa. Let me get my papers all straight here. And the legend behind the image of Edessa is that the king um, Abacus, Abacus, Agbar, sorry, of Edessa 
uh, was ill, and he wrote to Jesus and said, would you please come and cure me? Well, Jesus couldn't come. He was busy, and so he sent Thaddeus with a cloth that was impressed with the face of Jesus, and the king was healed. And so this is the legend behind the cloth. It actually it was transcribed in the 4th century, supposedly from the, the, the king who still had it, and because this was um, an event that happened during Jesus' time, this isn't related to the Shroud of Turin, which a lot of people say, oh, it's just like the Shroud. But the Shroud was a funerary shroud. And this was one that was impressed on Jesus' face um, while he was alive. Um, and this is currently in the Vatican. It's in a private chapel of the Pope. I think I have a close-up, but I don't know if you can see it any better. With the lights off, you can't really see it any better. Sorry. All right. Um, what we do see, though, let me go back to this one. What we do see is the beginning of a style of uh, painting Jesus that was characteristic of this Byzantine era. Um, this is typical of what we think of as being um, an icon. We ha there's a certain way that they would do the hair, a certain way that they would do the cloth. They gave him certain symbols. And the reason for the this was it was sort of a compromise. If they were going to not break the images anymore, they didn't want people just getting wild and painting Jesus just any old way. They wanted to have certain ways so that people would always read them as Jesus. And one of the uh, symbols that they had was Jesus always blessing and Jesus holding the book, which was the law. There also came to be very uh, stylized representations of the cloth. And I don't know if any of you know any icon painters today, but they're very, very rigid about the way they paint the cloth, the colors that are used in the cloth and the ways that they're, they're painted. And depending on which orthodox background you're in, they're painted in a very specific way. And this is uh, Christ Pantocrator, which means sovereign over all. This is another uh, Byzantine icon. Here we can start to see the real stylization of the folds. And I, can you see that OK? Can you really see this? It's a little bit dim, but here we have him here holding a scroll and this sort of like blessing gesture that he has here, and these sort of angular folds, and the real severe contrast of highlights and shadows in. I know. Ooh. It looks very oriental. When you think of the ancient uh, you know, um, Eastern art, that, that very, very elongated fingers of the um, Indonesians. And when you think of it getting a little bit closer as, as we're going in that direction. So a lot of that could be borrowed. This is another uh, stylized icon. Here we can see even the ringlets in the hair are, are um, specified in ways that um, can't be um, broken against. And the, the beard in this particular one is split in half. And there's a whole series of icons like all of these that look very, very similar. This one is um, in the Monastery of St. Catherine. It's in Sinai. And during this period of iconoclasm, uh, the only place that they didn't really break all the um, icons was in Egypt. And if you think of the Byzantine area going as far south as Egypt and all the way you know, up in, in northern Europe and east and west from there, uh, the, they didn't uh, break them down in Egypt. And so we have a lot of the icons that we know today are surviving from that monastery. This is um, where Mount Sinai is. There's a little monastery there at the bottom. Anyway, this is the Virgin with Child. And, uh, and the saints around it. Oh, by the way, that was encaustic. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I've brought some material so you can see. So encaustic is actually done with melted wax. It's actually a sort of a difficult technique. Uh, this is, um, this is uh, the Saint Minas, who was a Coptic saint, being shown with Jesus. And the reason I put this slide in is it really shows that they were trying to make it their personal, their own personal Jesus. You know, they're saying, okay, this was a Coptic saint, and here we're going to do an icon of our favorite saint with Jesus. It'd be sort of like having like Joe Namath and Jesus, you know, or whatever. <laughs> we we want to relate him to things we're familiar with, and here we can even see um, a relationship between the Coptic style of of uh, facial features and sort of like dark Egyptian look, and they even give Jesus that same look to make him more familiar to the people that were relating to that. This is a Byzantine sculpture, and it is um, called The Plaque with the Crucifixion and the Defeat of Hades. And this is interesting, not only because it's a beautiful thing. I love the, the arch that it's, that it's on, and these limp arms of Jesus are 
really nice. But underneath here are the soldiers who are dividing up the Christ's seamless garment. But what's most interesting is this. This is a, the crucifix that is being used to, it's not only the, um, the thing that Jesus died on and then therefore saved us from our sins, but it's the defeat of Hades. And so this represents Hades, the king of the underworld. And so symbolically, it not only represents what Christ did for us on the cross, but also the conquering of all those different pagan religions. And here through this crucifixion, we're going beyond that. And so the specific title for this shows that, that step from paganism into Christianity, um, the triumph over the pagan gods. Um, oops, sorry, I went to go this way. There we have Jesus up at the top. Um, I think it's neat the way they have these little uh, saints up above. They're kind of coming out of the, the um, architecture there. And you can see the saints. That's, um, it's St. John and Mary on the sides of Jesus. Um, really nice rendering of the clothes and sort of a realistic representation of Jesus. Um, when I was looking at this on a thumbnail, you know, on a computer when you're looking at these things, I kept looking and I said, that's a face. Can you see it? Can you see the face? So I made it really small so you could see that. You can see the, the locks of hair coming down the side. And if you kind of blur your eyes a little bit, it's like underneath here becomes the eyes. This is the nose and the, the shadows of the, the mouth and everything. I did. I was just I'm like, going, that looks like a little face. But I'm sure the artist had that in mind. So, yeah, isn't it? We'll go back to the big one there. See, here you can see it. Now that you know that it's there, it's easy to see. So anyway, that was the beginning of certain types of orthodoxy and certain uh, doctrines that were being formed um, during that time. Um, this is another um, Byzantine sculptural. This is um, on the front of a temple, and I don't think I have it. Sometimes I don't put where it is. But this is um, Christ, the overseer of all. And what we have around Christ in the center is 12 different scenes from his life. Let's see, they are uh, the Annunciation, the Nativity, the Presentation, a Baptism, the Raising of Lazarus, the Entry into Jerusalem, um, what they call the Metamorphosis, which is the Transfiguration of Christ, Crucifixion, the Deposition and the em Empty Tomb, the Anastasis, which is the, when he goes down into hell and then brings the people back up, and then the ascension. And so you can kind of follow that around, this being the ascension kind of coming up. And then surrounded here is Jesus at the top of each one. And each, in each group, he's blessing a different group of saints or a different group of Christian um, forefathers, patri um, uh, the patriarchs of Christianity. So I think I have a close-up, but again, it's kind of blurry. But here you can see a little bit about the the scenes that are on the side here is obviously the crucifixion. And then oh, I could move that a little bit. Oh, smiling camel. Do we have any questions yet? What makes you go, hmm? <laughs> what do you think about all this? Do we have any questions before I go on? This? image of Christ, uh, where he's on the cross, so his, his right hand is pierced, and there's like a support under it. Should I go back to that one? Which yeah. one was it? The ivory, the, the carving. Is not here, not supported. So, is there a oh, here. There, does it mean something? I think you can kind of see it's a support. You can kind of see a support here, but I don't know about that. Yeah, that's interesting that they didn't pierce it through this hand. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I am a little curious about the um, contemporary icons. Who I know that there. Are Yes, in fact, in fact, they serve a lot of different purposes. Icons can be a very personal thing, and they can be just a little piece of jewelry or something that's even in a locket. Um, <coughs> or it can be, they have these things called triptychs, and they're actually like little foldable things. And they were meant for travel. You would take them wherever you would go. If you moved, you always took them. But they're also used in the churches themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're also for personal use. Because the Muslims never had any. No, they they, they strictly had forbid. Temples except writing. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, you know, we share the same um, Old Testament with them. And they take the passage in Exodus, which forbids um, making unto thee any graven image. They take that very literally, and so they don't allow any, um, any uh, representation of saints or anything. And it's only done geometrically, and that becomes their spiritual sort of springboard. So everything is geometric in the Islamic mosques. I don't think that the Christians invented this symbolism, though. I mean, back in the, um, in the period of the Greeks and everything, they represented things with uh, the symbols to show who they were, too. But, um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Now, what they decided is that if God brought Jesus down in his own image, that it was okay for us to make an image of God, too, being creators and God's creations that they decided Constantinople. I think it was the um, Council of Nicaea where they decided that it was okay to make images. But there were still some problems with that, and it kind of was a rise and a fall through Middle Byzantium and, and those areas where the people would say, no, no, it's all wrong, let's break them all, and then they'd build it up again, and then they, somebody else would you know, get on their high horse about it. And that's why we don't have too many of them from the very early times. So, anyway. Yeah, thank you. There was a church in Istanbul that was originally uh, Muslim, and then the... Uh, Christians took it over. Mm -hmm. Boy, they had a field day. Because every little nook and cranny, they painted something in it. Right, <laughs> right. And, and it was because the whole place was bare uh -huh. when they took it over. Yeah. And this iconoclasm, I mean, still you know, takes place today. There's people who go into different countries, and they you know, tear down all their gods and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we think of that as being something from very early times, but it still goes on today, the iconoclasts. We're always trying to break the old traditions and supplant them with our own own beliefs. So icons are used to pray. Mm-hmm. Henry Nouwen, uh, a very famous, um, religious author, has a book that's called Praying with the Icons. So it isn't that you can't pray without them. It's just that, like anything, when you look at the icons, it puts a sense of Right, right. And as long as you keep that separate, you're not worshiping the object, yeah. but you're using that as, uh, as a tool for worship. Right. I think that's what they agreed on. Yeah. I remember going to St. Thomas More one time, and the priest was talking to a class like this and said, what's important is, is that you don't use the statues as symbols of God and that you keep it separate, and the statues can't heal you or protect you. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the back said, you know how mad that makes us when you say that? <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Um, right. It's still there. Uh -huh. Well, I think they still struggle with that. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Did you, you know there's a local man who does icons? Um, Ken Dowdy was an art teacher in Highland for many years, and then he retired, and now he paints icons for a living. Wow. And there was an article in the paper... I saw that. Yeah, it was in the last week. Yeah, him, and he's been commissioned yeah. to do um, an altar, I think it was. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and one of the other art teachers in Ireland was telling me a little bit more about him, and he said he's become very, very good at it and very famous. And he he worked on a six month job down in St. Hmm. Louis doing. Wow. Wow. Well, maybe I should do he, that. He was not <laughs> in that um, religion, but his wife was Greek. Okay. So his, 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 the Greek Orthodox. Yeah. And so yeah. he has come to it. Yeah, I, I read that article, and he was, he, was, he was talking about the specific colors that can be used for different garments to represent different people in very, very rigid ways that they can even portray the landscape in the background. You know, anything that is portrayed has very rigid guidelines, depending on which Orthodox faith you're, you're talking about. So we've gone from prehistoric, which led to the Egyptian art, which led to the Greek art, which was then borrowed by the Romans when they kind of mixed their stuff all together, and which became the Byzantine art, and they borrowed a lot of stuff from the Romans and Greeks, and later became, actually there's a Romanesque period in between here, and I didn't think I had slides from, but I do later on, but pretend that Romanesque is in there. They didn't call themselves Romanesques, but later in um, uh, you know, modern centuries, we decided to call them that. So that was a time when they were following Roman traditions, and then that was also followed by Gothic. And this brings to me to one of my favorite chapters, and one of my favorite things is the cathedrals in Europe. Um, this is Chartres. Has anyone ever heard of Chartres or, or been to Chartres? 
It's one of the most famous cathedrals. It's also one of the oldest. And it belongs in this talk because it was actually started in the fourth century. If you can imagine, this was uh, uh, founded on a Druid worship, uh, a Druid temple. They founded this first temple of Chartres. Um, what's interesting is that it still survives. I'm going to give you a brief history of, um, it was founded in the fourth century. In 743, uh, Hannah, the Duke of Aquitaine, burned it. And then in 858, there was a Viking raid, and the cathedral was burned again. But a bishop built it up again. And then in 1876, Charles the Bald, I had to put him in, just for Calder. <laughs> what a great name, you know, if you're going to go down in history as Charles the Bald, donated the veil of the Virgin Mary to it, and it became an even a more holy site because of that. But in uh, 962, it, it burned again, and it was partly rebuilt. In the year 1020, it burned again. Uh, you know, I think it's the candles. You'd think they would get it <laughs> after a while. Um, and you Fulbert. Like that. You wonder what, what there is there to burn. That's what I was thinking. A lot of, a lot of right. There. You know, I think that they use a lot of wood for the interiors. Did they just lose their furniture? You know, but there's part of the structure that has always remained because the stone won't really uh, fall apart. Uh, but Fulbert, the Bishop of Chartres, uh, constructed it again. And after he died, uh, there was in 1030 a consecration of the new cathedral. Um, and it was finished in 1037, pretty much as we see it now. With, um, there were some other apses that were added, added. But in 1194, guess what happened? Another fire. Um, and the uh, reconstruction of it was supported by Richard the Lionhearted. Now that's a little bit better name. Uh, but they actually started taking in donations from the people to rebuild the, the cathedral. Um, later it was dedicated to St. Louis. Um, and the, some of the outer chapels were built, and the Vendome Chapel, which is, we'll see that in the next slide, um, on the side. Uh, but in uh, 1506, guess what? <laughs> it burned again. It was struck by lightning, uh, and the, it burned down one of the spires. Um, and then in 1836, another accidental fire burned all the wooden framework, and it replaced it finally with a cast iron roof trussing. And so they finally got smart. But besides all that history, it's a beautiful, beautiful structure. And it's the beginning of some amazing architectural innovations, one being the flying buttresses, which are these here. And they're sort of big arches. They're like big ribs that come out of the sides of the chapel. And the purpose of that is so they could build the walls taller and taller. All right? They wanted to have the walls really tall. Remember, they used to have the columns around in Greek and Roman times to support it. Well, they wanted these really, really tall. And they did these flying buttress structures. And I think it's just an amazing architectural. Um, they were really thinking. Um, anyway, this is some of the outside of it. You can see this uh, beautiful sculpture going around. Imagine the labor that goes into some of these carvings. And I apologize for the blurriness of the side, but I wanted to show you some of the ornateness that was uh, in the Chartres Cathedral. Um, I also wanted to show you that they were thinking a lot. All right. Besides coming up with the architectural innovations, they were doing a lot of writing. This is a manuscript um, from one of the monasteries where they were also studying science. Science was going to play a part in the future of what uh, happens to Christianity. But here they're diagramming. You should get a kick out of this, Dad. The, the f five parts of the brain, maybe you know them. They are um, common sense, <laughs> imagination, judging, for some reason, they gave it a second imagination, which is composing and combining figures, and memory. Anyway, this is how they figured that out. But it was really, the reason I put this in is because there was really a revolution in thinking, not only in the way that they were doing architecture, but also in the way that they were seeing their faith. Um, but architecturally, here at Chartres, um, this is an amazing thing. This is a diagram of Chartres, and all that carving is on the outside and in the outer apses. The center part of the cathedral is left very bare, and that's for acoustical reasons. And the person, the architects who built this, had specific, um, if a person was singing here and it reverberated off of this line or this line, it would create these do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Which is really amazing. So there were, there were real uh, specific things about the, the height and the, there were, they were really beginning to do things with architecture and science that were pretty amazing at this time. I had to show the windows. What did they do? They, like one note as a base, and 
It was afraid of these various. Right. They knew the um, the numbers that related to the resonance of the different notes, and they they attached that to the different um, architectural elements of it, and they left it all. Um, very uh, barren in the middle, so that sound, and actually, has anyone ever been in one of the old cathedrals? I bet some of you have. The sound is amazing. Uh, acoustically, they are phenomenal. We could really take a note from them. <laughs> right, right. Uh, this is uh, one of the rose windows, and underneath it we have, um, again, I apologize for the quality of the slides, but I wanted to throw them in anyway. These are obviously different depictions of saints and um, this is Mary and Jesus. This one's a good one, though. How about that one? And here we have, this is from, also from Chart, and it's Jesus at the Last Supper. We do see a little bit of the stylism of uh, the iconoclast, oh, sorry, the um, uh, Byzantine era, the stylation of the way that they would do the face, and Jesus having his little blessing hand here with the cup. It was enough of a symbol. Where am I going? This is also from the outside of Chart. Uh, these are called jam figures, J-A-M-B, not like jelly. Um, but one of the innovations that they had is if you remember that Greek um, temple of Hephaestus and they had the columns. Now at this time they're still using column architecture, but they're starting to decorate them uh, mostly with figures. Um, and in reading about these, they, they had some ideas. This is supposedly uh, three figures of Christ, although it doesn't look like it to me. Um, but it is supposedly the um, Christ of the Ascension, Christ of the Apocalypse, and Mystery of the Incarnation. And I don't know, maybe you can look at it and figure out something that I'm, I'm not seeing. I can kind of see this with the scroll, and I think of John. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and then the Word became flesh. So maybe it's the scroll turning into him. But I'm not quite sure how or why. It may be something that was in his broken off hands depicted very feminine and so I'm confused about that I don't know whether the research was wrong um, but I thought I would include it anyway because they are just so amazing and beautiful but that could relate to the incarnation maybe yeah yeah and then here this is the another set of jam figures and here we see the old prophets holding the scriptures and they put them in the in the books and relating what was the prophets of old to the New Testament. So here I think it looks like, to me, Jesus, or Jesus and Mary with her little belly there. Belly showing. Very uh, unusual representation, but that would have to be uh, Jesus and Mary. And the symbolism that they're trying to give here is this is the one that was predicted by the ancient prophets. If you think of this as visual language, they're trying to teach people visually because the people couldn't read. Again, it's a close-up. I love the ornate uh, carving behind them, too. It's really amazing when you think of the tools that they had to use. This is also from uh, Chart, and again, it relates the prophets of old with uh, the newer things. Here we have Mary up in heaven ringing her bells and playing her harp, and below it, it's uh, as the prophets foretold. And here again, now, I don't know if this is Jesus or Mary. I think it must be Mary because of the veil. Does anyone know what Mary's doing there, teaching? I was having trouble understanding what this sculpture was. What do you think it is? She's got a switch in her right hand. She's going to beat them. Naughty little children. Okay. Well, you know, yeah, I guess everyone is entitled to their own interpretation. And maybe that's it. Maybe she's correcting the children or blessing the children. I don't know. Uh, but also the prophet underneath there. Sorry, what were you saying? Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. So here, underneath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But, you know, um, I wanted to get to illuminated manuscripts this week, but we're going to do that next week um, because there's just so much. Again, this is another part of the, this is part of the portal of Chart. Um, this is Notre Dame de Rhin which is one of my favorite cathedrals, next to Chartres. Um, I particularly like Rhin, because it's fun to say. 
R-E-I-M-S, the French don't pronounce the end of it, um, but it's the cathedral in Champagne. And so if you ever get a chance to travel, this is a great place to go to see um, old architecture and see one of the most beautiful cathedrals and also drink champagne along the way. Um, I think it's really nice. Every farmer has their own vintage and their own champagne and there's little tasting places all along the roads, which can slow a traveler down. Um, but anyway, uh, here we, we can see that same type of architecture that we saw. And again, going from the Byzantine into Gothic, uh, this was originally um, constructed in 496 AD and was completed in 1211. Really amazing. Um, actually, sadly, it was uh, completely destroyed during the First World War. Uh, completely bombed, uh, but what we see here is a bit of the reconstruction. Uh, the Rockefeller family funded the entire reconstruction of the cathedral. This is what the inside looks like. And these are some more uh, windows. No, it isn't. That's not it. Sorry. That, was, that slide wasn't supposed to be there. Forgive me. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the sculpture that was going on at that time. This is Arnolfo de Cambio, and he was one of the masters of the Middle Ages and did a lot of the carving that was in, in these um, cathedrals. He was an Italian, and he traveled around. Sometimes he did things in Florence and sometimes um, in Burgundy. Uh, this is the Dormition of the Virgin. And here we can see this, this very realistic folding of the cloth. If you can imagine carving this out of stone to try to get that type of drapery. Um, the Dormition of the Virgin, does anyone know what that is? I'm going to guess and say, you know, dorm, it's sleeping, right? Dorm, dorm, it's Latin for sleeping. But why would the Virgin be asleep? I thought maybe it's um, when she received the Holy Spirit. Well, it's, is that Catholic? She, yeah. She did, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That she never died. She only fell asleep and was taken up. Great. I needed, I needed that, little, um, that little fill in there. So this is the Dormition of the Virgin. And this is in the uh, facade of the Duomo. Um, this is another one by Arnolfo de Cambio. And again, we can see it how it relates to those old Greek and Roman sculptures. We see this very, very profound um, positioning and this really nice drapery around them. But um, it, it relates stylistically back to that Greco-Roman period that we had, we had seen um, last week. Give a little detail. She even looks a little bit Roman, doesn't she? Again, Jesus has to be blessing. <laughs> And the two fingers up, they were very uh, particular about that. Here's a side view of our, what I think is a pretty Roman <laughs> looking woman. Uh, this is another one called Precipio. And again, I was doing research in New Buffalo and I didn't have a dictionary, but I, it would just have to be the nativity because we have here the, um, the Virgin and the Child and probably Joseph here and the, the animals in the manger. And then this is the three Magi who are coming to visit. I think I have a better side of the Magi. There we go. Um, but here we can see, especially in this figure, how this is borrowed from the Greco-Roman stylization. He looks very, uh, very Roman. Um, here, one of the other Magi's. I love the sort of very humanist sort of gesture. <laughs> He's been on the road a long time. <laughs> you know? So uh, they were beginning to show a lot of realism in, in the portrayal of their figures here. So. This is another pause for questions. How are we doing? Doing all right? OK, I'll go on then. We're going to go on to what looks like Giz Gislebertus. Gislebertus. But if you say it in French, it's Giz Gisbertus. So we will call him Gislebertus, OK? Because <laughs> it's a Giz Gislebertus was uh, also a master of the Middle Ages. And this is one of my favorite pieces. Um, this is the dream of the Magi. Um, at first, I tried to rotate it, say, oh, they're, they're, they're on their side, they're on their side. But if you think of this, these are the, the three magi with their dream before they took, took off. And two of them are still asleep. This one is being woken up by this little touch of the angel, who's then pointing to the star, going, hey, there's a star. There's a star. Wake up and go. Beautiful picture, a beautiful image. But I mean, not only just from the symbolism that this sculptor was trying to portray, um, the beautiful round shapes and composition are really just amazing. Here's a detail. 
this is another one by Gisbert. Gis <laughs> Giselbertu. Huh? Giselbertu. Um, and this is Eve. And this, they say, is unrivaled in anything from the Middle Ages because of its, its depiction of Eve and its sensuousness. This was a brand new idea to put this type of sensual uh, creature in one of the cathedrals. Here we see her. She's like balanced on her, her knee and her elbow, almost like she's slithering too through this landscape. They were modest enough to put this stylized tree in there. But they did rotate her front to give her a full frontal nude um, portrayal there. Here she's kind of holding up her hand and she's whispering to, to Adam as she's grabbing the fruit here. And we can see the snake that's coming around, tempting her to do what she's about to do. But this was very, very new type of styling in that time. Oops, this is, here's a close-up of it. This is another... <laughs> you know, talk to him about that. Next time around, we'll advise that. Uh, this is another one by Gisbert Latou, and here we see this sort of very humanistic form of Mary kind of tilting her head like she's looking into the future, and it's almost like she's floating on this donkey, and this is just a fragment of the facade, but I love that it looks like here we are rolling into Egypt, it's called the flight into Egypt, it almost looks like they're on wheels like some type of toy, um, but here we have a detail of the, that beautiful sort of tilted head of um, Mary and Jesus' hand up in blessing. You know, this was interesting to me. I'm wondering, what is Joseph carrying? He's got a sword. And what is this? It looks like he's been to a yard sale. You know, he's got all this stuff on his back. It looks like some type of shield with plants. Let me go back to the, this one. Sort of like a shield with some type of leaf structure. He's got all kinds of stuff in his bag. Must not have been too happy about that. But anyway, this is one of, uh, this is uh, 10 years later. And this is when Gisbert Latou did the facade of the Cathedral Saint Lazare. And this is another um, really amazing cathedral. Here we have almost a whole uh, orthodoxy in this facade. We have Jesus and his, um, we've got the, uh, can you see that? You know, I can see it really well on my screen. But um, up in the upper right, you have, you know, some scenes from his life. On the left, let me see if my left is my next one. Yes, on the left. You have the uh, apostles here all beginning to kind of uh, come to Jesus. Um, underneath, we have the separation of the good and the bad. If you can see in the middle, let's see where my next slide is. No, here we are, the top pieces. That's uh, the Annunciation. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to this one. And the bottom of them, you can see this angel in the middle at the foot of Christ. And he's separating the good, which are going to go to this side, from the bad. And where do we see what Gisbert did for the bad side? Obviously the more interesting. Here we have, um, this is St. Michael, and he's weighing the souls and really contracting with the devil there to see who's going to go where, who's going to get lifted up onto the side of Jesus. And here's a detail of those people sort of like cowering, like going, oh no, oh no. And here you can see them kind of being lifted up here into this. You know, maybe we should turn off the light. Can you see that okay? I hate to do it at this stage, but, you know, actually from back here, it's not that bad. Okay. Um, here we have a portrayal of the devil. You can see these sort of grotesque, almost gargoyle-ish figures. That they're sort of like snakes coming out. And there you see a, bitter, a better picture of Michael and his weighing of the souls. Here, this is part of the structure that adheres it to it, but it's like a, um, a tool here. And someone calling out to... Um, to, I guess that would be uh, St. James, who's next to Jesus, saying, hey, wait, there's some people still here. Here you can see the image of, of um, Michael, the archangel. Here's another picture of it. And you can just see the grotesqueness of the, the way he portrayed the devil and the sort of very sort of regal way that the archangel is, is portrayed with the wings kind of going up in the holy symbol around there. I think I have one more slide. Really gruesome faces. And here you can see the snake that's starting to wrap around the devil. See there at the bottom. And more souls being weighed. I 
I think my last one is the three-headed snake that's wrapping around the, le the legs of the devil. And here you can see the people being very grotesquely pulled up. It's really an image of uh, a lot of misery. Uh, this is the last one I have of Gisverla too, and this is the hanging of Judas. Um, here we have that same type of feature. The devil is surrounding him and as he's uh, <coughs> hanging himself on the cross. Yeah, I have a detail of that here, too. So, just a detail of the carving. Um, about, oh, any questions? Myling Camel? All right. I'll move Other on. Than, um, how very important artists are. Right. They, I think they were more important then because so many people didn't read. When you think of how recent our very um, uh, literary culture is, you know, people 200 years ago really didn't read much. So it was very rare. So um, we're going to talk about Cimabue. Um, he was an Italian sculptor, and he started in the Byzantine. And he kind of moves us up into what we're going to do next week, which will be the Renaissance. You can still see some of the stylization that's very um, Byzantine, very much like the icons, the way that they portray the different musculature. But he's going to take it on a little bit further. Um, in this one, we can see. On the right is the Virgin Mary, and on the left is St. John. Here we can see that portrayal of Christ in the, um, the agony. And this way of painting Christ on the cross was also a Byzantine um, construction. Here we really see the folds in the drapery, very Byzantine, um, and very Byzantine representation of both Mary and St. John. Just keep in mind the the angles here, but what we are starting to see is he's taking a little bit of liberty and he's starting to use some shading. And that was almost forbidden. So here we have the full one. We also see some really beautiful drapery. And if we think about the drapery that was up with the saints, and now they're starting to do some highlighted drapery in the folds of his garment. Uh, this is a fresco. It was another technique that was used. And this is, I put this in because it is coming up on uh, Passion Week. And this is Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. And it's from uh, Santa Croce in Florence. Again, here is Cimabue 20 years later. He does another crucifix. And think of how that changed from this one to this one. Look, this is very busy. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. You think it would melt, especially with the, the fires. Uh, the other uh, technique they used a lot was egg tempera, and I'm going to spare you cracking the egg. Um, but what they would use is just the yellow, which always amazed me. I thought they would use the white, but they actually used the yellow part of the egg, and they mixed that with these ground pigments, or they would mix it with uh, part glycerin and make their paints. So the fresco is done just with pure pigment on... Um, mortar. This is a sample of fresco. This is a fresco ground. I put it on a ceramic tile. That's thick. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's thinner than it should be. Yeah. I think this is wax. That's wax. Mm -hmm. That's the wax. And what was on the fresco? On the tile to make it? Um, the, what's on there is, um, it's actually burnt calcium carbonate that loses a molecule in the burning process. And then when you um, slake it, which is you put it in with water, you slake it for several months to several years, it turns into a putty. It's kind of like a white mud. And when you spread it on, um, 
like a stone wall, what happens is it doesn't, it doesn't just stay like mud, like adobe. It actually, over time, connects with carbon dioxide and turns back into limestone. So it turns back into the stone structure. And what happens when you paint on it while it's wet, and that's why it's called fresco, it means fresh. If you paint on it with very fine ground pigment like this while it's fresh, that molecule of pigment gets put right into the stone. And so it's not a covering painting technique. You're actually creating colored limestone. And that's why it lasts forever. Um, some of the oldest ones are in, um, in Greece. In, in Crete, and they're thousands and thousands of years old. Mm. Four it thousand. always has to be a, a wet surface. A wet surface, right. If You can do it seco, which is called dry. You can do it dry on top of the surface, but it doesn't last. So. I have read that Michelangelo really did not know how to paint on fresco when he began. Well, actually, he did. his painting was good, but his technique for plastering um, wasn't nearly as good as like the Minoans from thousands of years earlier. And that's why you see that sort of crackly effect which I think is really good looking, you know, but he was mortified. <laughs> right, it wasn't supposed to crackle. Do you know how this fresco technique evolved? You know, um, that was part of the research that I did when I was in Europe. As I, you know, I went to uh, Knossos to, to study with the archaeologists there and talk to them about it. They, they showed me where they had their pits and how they did it but they don't know where the ancient Minoans found it. And so I went to Egypt to look. That was the most contemporary artistic style that was around. And we don't really know, but we're assuming that the Egyptians had some techniques that were like that, although theirs was more tempera. And they really kept their things much more covered. Uh, the Minoans were doing fresco outside, and they're the first civilization that we know that was uh, able to do an outdoor mural painting technique. So. By the way, it doesn't work up here. It doesn't survive the freeze. It doesn't? No. But you can do it inside. <laughs> so, well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any other questions. Very good. What was the glycerin for? Uh, the glycerin, they mix with the pigments to either do illumination of manuscripts or they can add a little bit of it to the egg tempera.